everyone welcome back to my channel so in this video it will be the first time i do a step 2 ck questions with you guys on amboss i'm gonna show you uh, my method of how to solve questions quickly like a lot of you have requested so at first i'm gonna show you how i do it quickly as if i'm reading out loud as if i'm like uh, thinking out loud with you and then I'm gonna show you how I uh, actually solve it like to explain uh, what really is going on so this is a timed session and I'm gonna show you guys how to solve um, step 2 CK questions so let's get started all right so the first thing I do is like I said I read the last two sentences excluding the which of the following so you read the two sentences before which are the following. Um, so I'm going to show you right now how I do it quickly and then explain. So uh, that's what's going on in my head. All right. His temperature is 37, pulse 92, blood pressure is... Okay, so I'm, gonna, I'm ignoring this. Systolic ejection click is heard at the right intercostal, second intercostal space, uh, which is the most appropriate next step in management. Um, Right now, I have something in my head that uh, is asking about treatment, right, or investigation because it's management. And uh, right now in my head, I also know that there is something wrong with the aortic valve because of this. And then I start reading from the beginning because uh, the last two sentences didn't give me much information. So a 72-year-old man, so that's an elderly man, I have to highlight that, comes to the physician for medical clearance for a more extraction. I'm going to highlight that as well. He reports he's able to climb three flights of stairs without experiencing any shortness of breath. He has hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and ischemic heart disease. I'm going to skip over this because I know this is a kind of a triad that there is atherosclerosis and there is ischemic heart disease. He underwent an aortic valve replacement for severe aortic stenosis last year. And now I'm correlating this with the systolic ejection click heard earlier and I'm correlating this with molar extraction. And so without reading the rest of the vignette, I know that this question is asking about what you should do in a case of someone who has an artificial valve, an artificial aortic valve, who should be doing a molar extraction which would expose him to bacteria and so I would give antibiotics particularly amoxicillin and I got that right so what's the clue here the clue here is that he had undergone aortic valve replacement and that's what you should have highlighted as um, highlighted here because an artificial valve is a predisposition to uh, endocarditis, subacute bacterial endocarditis after molar extraction. So there's something with Amboss guys, uh, which is called the attending tip. Uh, this is only in study mode, but this should be, uh, it's not something that you should be using to give you a hint or anything, but it usually uh, tells you what you should have highlighted to reach the diagnosis. So it's the, uh, the alternative of the first two sentences with your world explanations. So there's always going to be this hint that tells you um, what you should have highlighted to reach the diagnosis and here is the attending tip patients with prosthetic valves are at an increased risk for endocarditis particularly undergoing dental procedures notice here guys i didn't read the rest of the vignette because it's all distractions of course a patient with hypertension type 2 diabetes and ischemic heart disease would be taking all these drugs it doesn't matter to me all the vital signs are normal i didn't highlight them i only highlighted what is important for this Take a look, guys. He's asking about management of someone who's showing signs of an artificial valve and should undergo molar extraction. That's it. So, like, this is a kind of, like, 1 plus 1 equals 2. Ignore all the distractions, okay? So, administer oral amoxicillin one hour before the procedure. This is the usual prophylaxis for uh, subacute endocarditis because molar extraction or essentially opening up uh, any area of the of the body with a lot of flora so say for instance uh, here in the teeth tooth extraction or uh, an operation in the GI tract or an operation in the respiratory tract 
or in the skin as mentioned here all or genital urinary tract all of these have inherent flora that would expose the blood to bacteremia and so if the valves are abnormal uh, such as if there is a prosthetic valve then you will need prophylaxis with antibiotics to prevent infective endocarditis all right next okay i'm gonna read the way i do and then i'm gonna explain to you later so what i do right now is i'm skipping over this the most appropriate therapy i know right now in my head that this is a farm question for long-term prevention of headaches so this is a pharmacology question then i move on one sentence behind physical neuro exam shows no abnormalities and i move on another sentence behind and i see normal vitals and so he's asking about treatment for headache but i don't know what type of headache she has so i'm, so I'm gonna start reading the vignette a 36 year old woman middle-aged this is a demographic for a certain type of headache I'm going to see comes to the physician because of multiple episodes of headache over the past three months. The headaches last the entire day and are unilateral and throbbing. Right now, I just diagnosed it as migraine. And I'm going to move on and answer the question because I know in my head that long-term prevention of migraine is by beta blockers like propranolol. Even though I didn't finish, right? But that's what I do in, in, in tests, by the way, guys. That's what I do in tests. I skip. But... I still go back to the vinya. I don't move on to the next question before I read the whole vinya. I'm just showing you my approach. All right. So I read this, move on two sentences, nothing, then move on first two. Now I found out. So correlate this with that. This shows me she has shows me the diagnosis. This shows me what the question wants. So now I know it's migraine and what is long term prevention of migraine. Now I know it's propranolol. All right, without having to dive or delve into her story. But I'm still going to do it. During the headaches, she has severe nausea. Nausea is usually associated with migraines and is unable to work and perform her daily activities. She has noticed she becomes unusually hungry. This is the prodrome. Okay, she locks herself in the dark room because of photophobia. Takes ibuprofen. Okay, until it subsides and sets. However, over the past month, the headaches have increased, become more intense. Hypertension treated with amlodipine, uh, it's a risk factor, amlodipine, a calcium channel blocker. So you can see here that this didn't change anything in my answer. I still got it right without having to read this, right? But I'm just using an approach that helps me answer questions quickly. But then I never skip to the next question before I make sure that I haven't skipped on something important here that will change the answer. And so indeed, propranolol is the correct answer. And here is the whole fact sheet of migraine. Um, so the aura that she was experiencing was that of hunger, but it could be anything else. Um, could be triggered by menstruation or contraceptives, whether it changes. It's more common in females, usually lasts from four hours up to three days. Unilateral throbbing headache and nausea is kind of a giveaway, gives away the answer. All right. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. Use the same approach, which of the following is the most important best next step in management. This is essentially the um this is the stem or leading uh, sentence with any step two ck question so i'm gonna move on one sentence before the parents are away visiting friends and cannot be reached so now i know parents can't be reached the surgeon recommends an emergency laparotomy in my head i'm thinking this might be an ethics question and i can't reach the parents and there is an emergency right there now even though even though if you move back, uh, another sentence back, he has been accompanied by his 14-year-old brother. If you read backwards, you keep reading backwards, you're going to see that, um, or okay, I'm not going to read backwards, guys. So there is an emergency. Parents are not here. What's the next best step? But I don't know anything, right? So I'm going to read. A four-year-old boy is brought to the ER because of severe abdominal pain and bilious vomiting for six hours. Don't continue. Abdominal pain and bilious vomiting for six hours. 
The surgeon says he recommends an emergency laparotomy. You read that first, right? The parents are away, so you can't take their consent. What's the best next step? That's essentially what the question wants, no matter how much fluff they keep throwing in. So, because it's an emergency in a child or in anybody, you don't need parents' consent. And so, I'm going to choose perform emergency laparotomy. This, guys, is how I do it, all right? But still, you should be reading the rest, even though it wouldn't change anything, really, with the answers. But like just um to be like to feel more comfortable uh his temperature is 37.8 pulse is high distended abdomen tenderness to palpation guarding rebound all of which suggest probable um i don't know appendicitis maybe uh bowel sounds are decrease or maybe uh it's uh intestinal obstruction even if you can't reach the diagnosis, guys, it's an emergency. A baby here. His parents are away. I don't care about his 14-year-old brother. No offense. But if it's an emergency, no one's consent should be taken. Uh, although it's required at all times, it is not required in emergencies. Right? Now, moving on to the next question. Uh, again, which of them is the most appropriate next step in management? And I skim through. I find out these are stuff related to toxicology. So these are like, yeah, hemodialysis, charcoal, and stuff. I move up. In addition to securing the airway, now I kind of am a little bit sure that it's a toxicology thing. Blood pressure is low. Pulse is low. So... I'm going to move on to read the entire vignette because I didn't reach anything. I just know that this is probably a toxicologic syndrome where uh, blood pressure is low and pulse is low. Which brings me to a thought of all those, um, all those uh, toxins or like drugs, drug toxicities that lead to bradycardia and hypotension. It's uh, usually a narrow list because... Uh, anything that causes hy hypotension should cause reflex tachycardia. And so if you find uh, hypotension with bradycardia, then there must be something that is either activating the vagus or blocking, um, uh, like activating the vagus in the heart or blocking both negative inotropic and negative chronotropic effect. And these are only a narrow list of drugs that called the cardiotoxic drugs and also uh, the organophosphates also activate the vagus. So that's some that's what's going on in my head. But I'm still gonna read. A 22 year old woman is brought to the ER four hours. Remember, with toxicology, you always need to highlight the time, even if it wouldn't matter. But just keep it in mind after the ingestion, 25 tablets of an unknown drug in an attempt to commit suicide. Her temperature is normal. Pulse is 41. Respiration 14. Blood pressures. 88. So, as you can see, bradycardia hypotension, uh, pulse oximetry, oxygen saturation is low. She's confused and oriented only to person. Pupils are equally reactive to light. Even though this is a negative sign, which means it doesn't indicate any pathology, uh, it has confirmed to me that uh, I should exclude organophosphorus poisoning because with organophosphorus poisoning, even though it also shows bradycardia and hypotension, yet uh, the pupils will be myotic and will not be reactive to light. They're going to be fixed and constricted. Examination shows cold, clammy extremities, scattered expiratory wheezing and ronchi, uh, even though that can confuse with organophosphates a bit. Uh, blood glucose is 65. EKG shows prolonged PR, narrow QRS. Okay. So what is this? We try to resolve the hypotension by giving um, intravenous fluids, but it's still low. It's still not enough. So based on her clinical picture of bradycardia and hypotension, I figured out this is a syndrome where uh, uh, this could either be caused by something that activates the vagus like organophosphates 
or something that has a cardio inhibitory effect such as beta blockers calcium channel blockers or digoxin right so all of these uh, lead to bradycardia and hypotension however organophosphates are ruled out because your pupils are equal and reactive to light and digoxin is ruled out because um, there is no associated nausea vomiting or uh, yellow vision like so these are some of the stuff that accompany um, digoxin toxicity and also uh, not much characteristic ekg findings here ekg shows prolonged pr and narrow qr is nothing else with digoxin there's additional stuff on ekg like st uh, sag and uh, stuff like that and so now i ruled out a lot on my list i only have beta blockers or calcium channel blockers now i am sure it is beta blockers because of the hypoglycemia so now we did reach the diagnosis now what's the management of what's the antidote of a beta blocker it will be glucagon right so this question requires you to read the whole vignette and to highlight a lot and that's um pulse we did highlight that blood pressure we did highlight that she's confused as in there is mental status changes uh cold clammy extremities wheezing we did highlight that blood glucose concentration was essential to rule out a lot and rule in beta blockers instead ekg findings as well so we did highlight what should be highlighted fairly um so the attending tip essentially mentions the stuff needed to reach the diagnosis so that's the attending tip um, skips the step of diagnosis so the attending tip gives away the the first step in answering the question which is reaching the diagnosis which is first order but this question is second order which you will have to reach on your own by knowing the best management for beta blockers. Get it? Um, so usually US assembly questions are second order, third order. And so it's not enough to reach the diagnosis, which the attending tip will give you. But it's important to highlight what's important to reach the diagnosis. Because if you didn't reach the diagnosis, you're not going to be able to answer the second order question coming later on. The attending tip saves you this first order step of reaching the diagnosis. And then you start thinking about whatever is derived, like infer from that, from this diagnosis. The next best step in management for beta blocker intoxication is glucagon. All right? I hope this helped, guys. And let me know if I can do another episode.